and um, to share my screen with you. There we go. Can you see and hear me? Yes, right. So thank you for that introduction. And uh, oh, sorry. So today we'll just do, it's a big subject. It's my favorite subject. And um, we can only do a brief overview. So please think of questions and um, any comments and what you would like to know more about in palliative care for children. So we're going to briefly look at understanding the goals of palliative care for children. And that includes some well-known definitions, looking at which children would benefit from palliative care and how we apply the principles of palliative care to children. And I love this quote from Sister Frances Dominica, one of the great early pioneers. And she was an Anglican nun and a pediatric nurse who founded Helen House, the world's first children's inpatient hospice. And this is something we always need to remember. We are the pupils. The child and the family are the teachers. And we must be open to learning all the time. And every child and family that we come into is a masterclass. And we also need to remember that children are not small adults. You've learned a lot about adult palliative care. And while the principles remain the same, the way that we apply it when caring for children are very different. And why do we need palliative care for children when we have this wonderful field that is palliative care? Well, globally, we know that at least 21 million children in the world would benefit from palliative care. And this is from research that we did with UNICEF. And 98% of those children live in low and middle income countries. And so palliative care that has been designed in high, high income, high resource countries is not always suitable for palliative care for most of the children that we look after. So you're in India, I work um, in South Africa and most of my work has been done throughout Africa and Asia. Um, and so I see the differences. And only around 5% of all the children who need palliative care in the world are receiving it. And most of those children receiving it are in high income countries, which are the darkest green. India, South Africa, we've done a really quite a good job in developing palliative care for children, but we are still very, very far from reaching all of those children who need it. So when we talk about a child in palliative care, there are different groups of children. Today, we will talk more about the patient, the child who is a patient in palliative care from that little one minute old neonate, that tiny baby until young adulthood. But we also deal with children who are siblings, children who sadly are primary caregivers as well, and the child of a sick parent. So while we focus today on the patient, many of these principles will also apply to the other categories of children as well. But we need to also remember the age. So while the standard international age for children is from birth until 18, in many cases, especially in low resource settings and where there perhaps is no adult palliative care, those so-called children and young people will remain on the programs until well into their 20s and sometimes even older than that. This child is also someone's son or daughter. And so we're dealing with families who are trying to cope with caring for a sick 
and often dying child. And that child in our program, because of the conditions that we have and we see in children, many of these children are with us for over a number of years. So that child is growing and developing and our approach has got to, to change as they grow and develop. That child is within a culture and within a belief system that we have to take into account. And we need to remember that these children are vulnerable. Legally, they often may not make their own decisions, although we try to involve them in decision making. And because of their vulnerability, they have adults who take the final decisions for them. So to look at the definitions of palliative care. So whether we talk about pediatric palliative care, children's palliative care, palliative care for children, these are all exactly the same thing. It's just personal choice. And always, as with adults, the essence of palliative care is the relief of serious health-related suffering and the improvement of quality of life. The way we do that is going to differ. And our interventions are not so much a response to the disease and the diagnosis, but to the suffering of the child and the family. So the WHO, of course, led with a definition of palliative care for children. And I'm not going to read to you from this very busy slide, but just to show you that there is a definition, I'll now go through elements of that particular definition. So it represents a special but closely related field to adult palliative care. And it is based, just as with adults, on immaculate assessment and holistic assessment. And it's active and total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit. And it also involves giving support to the family. So the child and the family are our unit of care. And it begins when the illness is diagnosed. And that diagnosis might be made while that baby is still inside the mother, in the uterus, when they might have, um, they might have suspected a life-limiting or a life-threatening condition, done the relevant tests, and can then start to prepare the family. And it continues regardless of whether or not a child receives treatment directed at the disease. So if that child, say, has cancer, and there is a possibility of the child going into remission, even while the child is receiving chemotherapy, radiotherapy, therapeutic surgery, they can still receive palliative care alongside potentially curative treatment. Also with HIV, while that child is taking antiretroviral therapy or TB, TB therapy, we know that because of circumstances that that treatment may be discontinued or fail. And so we continue to provide some form of palliative support. And so just as with adults, we have to look at this child as a whole being, to look at their body, the clinical issues, the psychological, the intellectual, because these child might be in school, they need to grow and develop as much as possible. The spiritual and children are spiritual beings and the social distress. And it requires, just like adults, a broad multidisciplinary approach that includes the family and where the child is old enough to understand and to be part of decision-making, it includes the child as well. And we use, especially where resources are limited, community resources are so important and it can be implemented even in the poorest communities. And we use a connected team approach. In Africa, we say every child is my child, but also everyone else's on the team. And this is our pharmacist who actually has the most incredible relationship and who's almost the best play therapist there is. 
who doesn't mind getting down and dirty and playing in the sandpit and playing in the mud with these children. And it can be provided wherever that child is, whether it's in a care facility, a hospital, a community health center, or whether it is in the child's own home, which is where most of the palliative care will be provided. But I think this is an even better definition. And it's from Matty Stepanek, who lived till he was almost 14 with a rare condition, neurodegenerative condition that his three siblings had died from and his mother is still living with. And he was very wise, as so many of these children are, when they have long-term chronic conditions and lots of interaction with the health services, they often become wise old souls. And he called himself a poet, a peacemaker, and a philosopher who played. And he brought out a numerous poems that he wrote and publications, and his wisdom lives on. And he said, palliative care for children no longer means helping children to die well. It means helping children to live well. And then when the time is certain, to help them die gently. And if you remember one definition, remember we help children to live well and to die gently. And as I've said before, it's from before birth to that tiny newborn baby, to the young, young baby, the toddler, the young child and into young adulthood. And so for us to, to manage and to work with these children from that tiny, tiny little newborn, until that young adult, right through the teenage years as well, with all their challenges, we need to be educated. So we need education for each and every level. We need to understand how children develop, not only physically, but also emotionally and spiritually as well. So we need to develop that knowledge and skills that helps us with all these children. We need to be able to adapt because that child we might get in as a two-year-old we might still be looking after you as a 10 year old and a 15 year old. And so we need to adapt our interventions. We need to have communication skills for all ages. So that tiny baby that we cuddle and, and coo and talk baby talk to, to that teenager that we can have very, very profound conversations with. And throughout, let me say to you, keep your sense of wonder because children can absolutely amaze you. So one size does not fit all children. We need a broad level of understanding and knowledge. Many causes of death in children are different from adults. Many of these children don't make adulthood. And so your adult guidelines are not appropriate for children. While we're caring for them, they are continue to, to develop physically, emotionally, cognitively, which means their medical and social needs, as well as understanding of disease and death is complex. And we need to accept that. Their reaction to medications might be different because of their different metabolism. And the dosages and the medications may be more complex. And this is Juan, who has now got to 16 with Pompey disease, and this is the, the list of its side effects of his medication when he was around eight years old. We see a different spectrum of diseases. We see strange syndromes, some that have never been seen before or very seldom. We see congenital conditions, metabolic and genetic conditions as well. And as I've said, some of these children do not make um, it to adulthood, and some of these children live for a very, very short while. And so we have to deal with, with family death and parental um, emotions and bereavement. Some prognoses are very unclear. We don't know what's going to happen. We just take each day at a time. I've spoken about growth and development, but this impacts on how their condition develops as well. And we know that the impact on families and society, the communities that they interact with, and the greater community 
can be so much more impactful than that of an older adult. Children communicate differently, and we'll talk a bit more about that later on. And the bereavement in children, we need to remember that children grieve, and I spoke about siblings, so the grief of siblings, but the grief of that child who is sick, knowing and understanding that they're not going to be too able to participate in the same activities as their friends, that they might not be growing older like their friends, that because of their condition, they can't go to the parties. And so they have this anticipatory grief, even when they are. I've spoken about some conditions lasting for many years, but symptoms may also present differently because of their different development. And we talked about immaculate assessment and assessment can be very difficult with pre and non-verbal children. And so we have to use other skills and other methods of communication with these children as well. And then remembering that children, when they're young, they have different perceptions of what illness is and what death and dying are. And they might, they might show us these by the way they interact with us, um, by the way they play, by the way they draw, or use movement. And very important to remember that the illness and death of a child is often more draining on staff than adult palliative care. And so when we develop a program for children and children's palliative care, we need to remember that issues of self-care and staff support systems are absolutely essential. Because even though we know intellectually that children die, there is the widespread belief, and I think even within ourselves, is that death in childhood is not normal, is that children should live to adulthood. They should live to grow up and study and get married and have children and do the things that we've all been fortunate enough to achieve. And so there is still that a deep belief within ourselves that when a child dies, it is against the laws of nature. And the death of a child for the adults, for the parents and the grandparents, um, is that not only losing that child they knew, but losing their dreams of what that child could or would become. So just very briefly to look, we've spoken about general conditions. I'm just very briefly going to touch on these. So if we look, and this is globally, you will see that neonatal conditions and protein energy malnutrition are the two highest conditions that we see for palliative care. That's interesting, isn't it? And then we're looking at things like HIV, congenital anomalies, heart disease, and of course, cancer. But globally, cancer comes down right to, to a fairly low level of deaths um, globally. But we know in low resource countries where access to resources and where um, the uh, identification of the condition is often delayed, is that they have a higher death rate from children. And then of course, neurological conditions. And uh, Together for Short Lives in the United Kingdom, um, originally an organization called ACT, grouped these, these uh, conditions into four different categories that we can use to understand which children would benefit from children uh, from um, palliative care. So um, I'm going to go through these and it's largely based on disease trajectories or the pathways which will help the clinical team and the multidisciplinary team with their care planning for these children. So the first group is life-threatening, may or may not be able to be cured. And here we think of something like cancer, leukemia, um, kidney disease that where the child may be able to get a kidney transplant, those kind of conditions, 
So there we're dealing with an uncertain trajectory. Then we have conditions where premature death is inevitable, but they make up for long periods of wellness because of treatments. And that is often many neurological conditions. And then we have those conditions which from birth, we know the treatment is going to be palliative and there's absolutely no way to cure or to even really slow down the condition. And then with the fourth group are irreversible but non-progressive conditions. So we think of a child with cerebral palsy, we see a lot in India, which we see a lot here in Africa as well, where if that child is well cared for, that condition won't progress. But often because of poverty and from lack of understanding and poor conditions, um, these children actually, their conditions do progress and can lead to premature death. So the trajectory with category one is that if they get treatment, they may go into, into remission. And you can see how they have a diagnosis, they take a deep, a dip, they have a treatment, and then they go into remission. But if it is not curable, if that cancer goes into remission for a while and then recurs and they have a relapse and treatment does not work, you can see again this, this different um, trajectory where they go into remission, but then they relapse and it leads to death. And then with the second category where they can live for quite a long time with their condition, but it leads to inevitable death and the death is usually from complications. The third group of those that we know is that there is, is no way that we can absolutely, we can cure them or even really slow down that trajectory. And it's, it's a general just deterioration over time. And so if we know these concepts, then it helps us to make decisions on how to advise the family as well on how aggressive active disease treatment should be. And it also depends on what resources are available. So if there's a chance of cure, the treatment might be quite aggressive if they have the resources, might even include uh, intensive care admissions. Category two, where there's a chance of reasonable quality of life, it's usually quite aggressive as well with a lot of, of rehabilitation activities um, with three, the treatments where there's no known cure. The treatments may be experimental, but the focus is usually much more on palliative care and keeping that child as active um, as possible for as long as possible. And category four, with its life limiting, the focus is on rehabilitation and improving quality of life and seeing what is the maximum potential that this child can achieve and hopefully helping that child to live a normal length of life. And so resources make a big difference. So if antiretrovirals are available and the child has the resources to maintain taking the antiretrovirals, we know they're going to go into a higher category. But if there's no antiretrovirals available, or the resources mean that child doesn't get to clinic to collect the antiretrovirals, and the family is not that supportive because of, because of poverty, that child can actually die from HIV. And sadly here in our children's hospice, we are seeing a number of children who come to us too late um, because they haven't been taking the antiretrovirals because of lack of resources. And the same with renal failure. If they can have a transplant, they can go and, and lead a healthy life. If they can receive dialysis, they can live for a long period of time. But if they do not qualify for dialysis or it's not available, then these children will die from their kidney failure. So I think it's important that we classify these children so that it helps us with the way we plan for them. So we spoke about leukemia, but Down syndrome, if they have normal, their heart is fine and um, they can live an absolutely normal life, congenital heart disease, which is not for surgery, um, we know that these children will actually die young. So in Africa as well, because there is so much loss, grief, and bereavement, we have added a fifth category. 
and that is a, a category for bereaved children. And we need to understand that everything we do is within the children's rights framework. And globally, we have the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And at national level, we have national and regional children's rights and children's protection legislation. So every country will have that in place. And that will also impact on the ethical issues that we see with children. So to work in the field of palliative care for children, we need to understand the differences in age and development, the culture of childhood. Children live within the greater culture of the country, the culture of their own particular family and community, but also within the culture of childhood. And we often forget that. And then they, they come and they interact with the culture of the health system as well. And so you think of that little child who's having to adapt to all these different cultures. And then we have the languages of childhood, which might not be words, could be drawing, could be play, could be movement, um, but we need to know those languages as well. They express their emotions differently. They have less control when they're younger. They learn and understand in different ways, depending on their developmental stage. And we need to also understand that children are spiritually aware. And here I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about spiritual awareness, which is linked to understanding, meaning, making meaning, um, looking for purpose in life and connectedness with something greater than they are, with nature, with others, and with themselves. And communication with children through changing ages and stages takes different forms. And here we have Sefo, who's our admin manager, but loves babies and will leave the office to bath the baby and play with the baby at every opportunity. And one of our little babies, and you can see that there are no words, but the communication is taking place between the adult and the baby. And they can, children communicate comfortably and personally in their search for meaning. So I love these two from Children's Letters to God, which is an almost must have when you're working with children. From the question about the giraffe, did you mean for the giraffe to look like that or was it an accident? Which is very down to earth, isn't it? We have a giraffe, we have giraffe just down the road from us and I love them, they are beautiful. But that long neck, and the little boy, Daniel, he is older. And so he asks, dear God, I love you because you give us what we need to live. But I wish you would tell me why you made it so we have to die. Very deep and very profound. And a question that we would actually like to ask God or however we see him as the spiritual greatness around us. Children also have magical thinking. The belief that unrelated events are causally connected, despite the lack of any logical link. And this is when a child believes they did something wrong. They might have been naughty, they might have told a lie, they might have punched their little sibling. And they believe that because they did that, it caused their illness or the illness or death of another, especially the illness or death of someone close to them, a parent, a grandparent, a sibling. And we call it magical thinking, um, but we as adults would call it guilt. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong that caused my child to be ill? And the languages we spoke about earlier, they express through creativity. Children are very creative. They love to draw. They love to paint, they love colors. They enjoy music and dance. And as they get older, poetry or storytelling might be their way of expressing how they are feeling their fears and their anxieties. And so when we're dealing with children, we don't only talk to them, we watch what they're doing. We look at the colors they use in their art. And we never ever assume anything. 
if you think a child is trying to tell you something through their art, through their song, through their dance, through their stories or, or poetry, ask them. That is the first question. Why did you say that? Why did you use that color? Why did you draw that? Why did you dance like that? And we never, so we never interpret. We ask them to give us the meaning. Because if they're old enough to draw pictures like this, they are old enough to tell us. And so with these two pictures, they are very explicit, aren't they? On the one hand, this child's fear of needles, and on the other, this child's love of the hospice where they stand. And play. One of the best things about palliative care for children is that we have to go back to our childhood. We have to remember that the child in us is the oldest part of us. And being the oldest part, we sometimes forget it. So we need to go back to being able to play, to participate with them in playing, to help them relax and talk to us through their play. Um, and that is the most fun of all. And it's absolutely essential in children's palliative care because children communicate through play. They collaborate with others. And when they get together as a group, then they start talking. And when one talks about how they're feeling, it allows the others to do that as well. Play is a way that they learn. So they can learn from each other, but they can also learn from the activity of play. It helps them to find meaning in what is happening around them. It also teaches them that children, when they're very ill, they often feel so isolated. They're in hospital, in a cot, on their own, and they see children in other beds or cots, but they're not communicating. So it teaches them to share. But I think most of all, it gives them a sense of control and it builds their self-confidence, which often is so not by all that happens to them within the health system. And this is a little boy that I was, this is just last Saturday, we were playing and he was sitting on his own and he was putting these figures in line. And when I went and I, I sat next to him and I asked them about the figures, each of the figures was representative of something that he was feeling. And he used these, he would pick one up and say to me, and he's feeling cross, and he's feeling sad, and he's feeling angry. And when I asked him why was he feeling angry, he was actually telling me a story about his feelings, but he was using the figures he was playing with to explain them to me. And when they're together as well, they often think they have the courage to ask important questions. This is a little group of three and four-year-olds who came up to me. I was sitting with them. They were together in the garden, and I was just sitting watching them and just being the adult observer. And they came up to me holding hands. We'd had a little girl who died in the house that morning. They had been prepared because, you know, we, have, um, we don't have single rooms. Children are together in rooms. And when a child is dying, of course, we put them into a single room. But because they, they know and they understand that somebody is gone, they came up to me and they asked something that was bothering me. What does it mean to be good? And the possible responses are first of all, never lie. Always ask the question, why do you ask me that? What do you think? What made you ask that question? What have you been told? Because you need to know where they are in their understanding. And sometimes I might say to them, I don't really absolutely know because it hasn't happened to me, but this is what I think. And that's when understanding of the cultural and the belief systems is so important. And I know we're going through a lot here, but I'm just very briefly going to, to talk about pain being different in children. Of course, it's not different. They experience pain. If they have a condition that we would know as painful, then a child will feel pain. 
So if they have diarrhea, and we know if we have diarrhea, we get cramps, that child will have it, even if they can't talk to us and tell us. And so when we assess, we always say to people, go from head to toe. Start at the head and work your way down to the toes. And that can be a game in itself for the little child to relax it. And never forget the mouth. These children often have sores in their mouth. They have dental problems. They get thrush. So we always need to, to look inside the mouth and the ears because these are often the source of pain that the child hasn't told you in so many words, but we can see it. And we can use what we call the quest principle. The question, the child or the parent, we always use pain rating scales, always with children. We can evaluate the behavior and the physiological changes. So we can look at how they are they irritable. Are they isolating, not playing with the other children? Is their heart rate going up? We can secure the parent or the primary caregiver's involvement. We can look at what the cause of the pain could be and take that into account. And then, of course, we can take action and evaluate results. We can use a particular scale, like the flat scale, for young children and those who cannot communicate because of their condition, where we're going to look at the face and the legs, how active they are, at the level of crying, and how easy or how difficult it is to console or comfort them. Um, and just to say to you, these will all be available to you um, to read in more detail. We love the Elan Body Tool, where the child can show you where the pain is and if it spreads through the body. And also, of course, the well-known, very validated uh, pay, uh, faces pain scale, but the child must be old enough to understand that the expressions on those faces are a level of the pain they're experiencing. Because I've seen children who've looked at them and we know they've had really quite severe pain, but they actually want to be happy. So they'll point to, to the zero or the two because that's how they want to be. So they have to, we have to teach them to understand it. And um, I won't go into this in great detail because of time, but just to say to you that the work that Stephen Friedrichsdorf has done on multimodal anesthesia is absolutely brilliant, where he says, when we look at that child, yes, we're going to use medication and we're going to use it in the right dosage. Um, and we're going to use adjuvant medication as well that I'm sure you've learned about. And we're going to use nerve blocks and things like that. But we're also going to be using, using things like rehabilitation, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, getting the child back to school, if they can do that in any way, and psychological modalities. And then, of course, spiritual. Because children are looking, why am I like this? Why can't I play? Why can't I go to school? Why have I got this pain? And that's a spirit. these are spiritual questions. Um, and then all the other non-pharmacological therapies that one can use, such as breathing, bubble blowing, um, self-hypnosis, which is, is very easy to teach older children, relaxing their muscles, biofeedback, plus massage, and things like aromatherapy, acupressure, and acupuncture. And if you have um, the availability of virtual reality. So when we're treating the pain in children, we need to help them to play again, to go back to school, to find meaning, and to use medication, yes, if that's indicated, but to also look at what are the other therapies that are going to help this child. And the use of technologies. Children love technology. So we can use it for many different things. And UNICEF, which of course leads on, on the protection and care of children, they have a technology department which is looking at how to develop, how to develop and provide better health care through technology. And so at the end of life, the end of life can be very, very difficult, different. Because remember, if this is your child, if this is a child you're caring for, at the back of your mind, there's always that light of hope. Until the end of life comes when you know that the hope is going to be for pain relief and a peaceful death. And these children must not be left alone to face the 
overwhelming impact of this disease which is progressing. What they need more than anything is constant caring adults. And Dr. Po Heng Chong from Singapore, he, wrote, he actually did this wonderful study for his PhD. And he identified what a good death would be in a child with a life-shortening illness. And he said, one is letting go, the child and the parents, the family and ourselves. So we need to let go and realize that this child is not going to live. We need to acknowledge the child, the child who, who they are, where they are. We need to help them find closure. I had a little boy, he was three. He had very few words and, and he's never been able to walk, but he knew he was dying. And he, he had me taking him to his favorite places and his favorite people. And then he died. A little three-year-old who just turned three knew he was dying. He found closure like that. And we need to let the child be as much in control as is humanly possible. Let them choose their toys, let them choose their clothes, let them choose what food they want to eat. And we need to always remember, we spoke about hope, the miracle of hope. It's just that hope changes as the condition progresses. And to acknowledge that with our children, there are different levels of awareness. And with the child who is nonverbal, or who is perhaps appears to us comatose, there might still be an awareness. So to treat them, to talk to them, to touch them gently are so important. And to provide this good death, we need systems and processes in place, and that includes trained personnel and volunteers. To reduce suffering, we need to allow normality as much as possible and to provide comfort. And so we can have an ABCD approach and that really is very simple to have an advanced care plan for the child, including the child's wishes and his primary caregivers. We need to look at the big picture. So we're looking at family, cultural and religious issues about who the decision makers are and the ethical and the legal issues. We've spoken about communication and then communication to all involved with gentle honesty and ongoing explanations. And we need to prepare the family and the child. We can say to them, if you're not hungry, you don't have to eat. If you want to sleep more, that's fine. Your body's just getting closing down and it's telling you you need to sleep more. Religious rituals are important. They're important for the child who's old enough to understand that they are very important for the family in their grief. And so your faith leader's involvement is so important. And then, of course, the legal requirements. What do you do when a child dies at home? And then always, 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 after the death of the child, give the family time to say their goodbyes and to take care of the child after death. I've had cases where a child's died in the hospital. We've taken the child home. The parents have spent time at home. They've bathed the child. They've put them in their favorite clothes. Um, and only when the family are ready do we take the child. That also depends on belief systems and culture and bereavement support for the other children and for the family is, is also essential. We've spoken a bit about spiritual assessment and care. And so we always look at what gives meaning and purpose to this child's life for the baby of not just being loved and cuddled and comfortable and having enough food. How do they connect with themselves, with others? And we can see it from the way they look, their facial expression, and when they're older, whether they actually reach out or play. We know that we see how they connect to something greater, and that can be through nature. Nature is a wonderful, wonderful place to do spiritual connectedness. And also remember the mystery and the paradox. They are things that we can never understand. And throughout, spirituality we never take hope away hope is that light and the light doesn't go out at the end of the tunnel that at the end of the tunnel when death occurs the hope is linked to what their belief system is and so for us as adults 
we have to take the lead. The child is too young. They haven't got the legal rights to do so many things. The families are too tired and too deeply emotional and involved in caring for these children. So it's up to us to be the advocates, to speak for them, to fight for the right medications, to fight that they get palliative care and essential medications. Um, and so for each of us, we need to become an advocate. And as Andrew Lake, who is the former CEO of UNICEF said, basically remembering what Natty Stefanik said about living well and dying gentle, gently, the living well includes having to give them as normal a life as possible, the quiet miracle of a normal life. And so next Friday is that big day for global advocacy for children's palliative care. And all you have to do next week, Friday, is to wear a hat. And when people say to you, why are you wearing that hat? You say, because I care about children who need palliative care. And let me tell you, I want you to care as well. So the second Friday of October is always hats on for children's palliative care. And there are a number of resources. Nearly all of these, apart from the Oxford textbook of palliative care for children, the rest of these can be downloaded from the International Children's Palliative Care Network. And they also have a wonderful group of um, e-learning courses. And these are in multiple languages as well. And icpcn.org, go into the website and you will have access to all of these wonderful resources. And so thank you. Thank you for letting me share this time with you from South Africa. And this is just a picture of the Free State Province where I live in spring. And we're in springtime at the moment and the beautiful cosmos are out and flower. So thank you. And any questions, I will try to answer. And if I don't know the answer, I'll try to find out for you. Thank you so much, ma'am. If it's the time to uh, clear all your doubts, if anyone having any doubts, you can put in the chat box or, or else you can unmute yourself and ask anyone. Uh, yeah, ma'am, I'm Jayantu Ghosh. Uh, may I just put in some of my queries? Yes, please do. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. It's a very new uh, topic in palliative care and so much discussed uh, in, sh in such a short time. So it will need time to grasp the whole topic. But still, I have pointed out a few uh, uh, bullet points. So I would very much appreciate if you could put a light on this. The first one is uh, yeah, in that slide where you uh, have said about the requirements uh, to provide uh, pediatric palliative care, there you have mentioned a point, a sense of wonder. Uh, yes. So could you please explain it a bit? And shall I put uh, my queries uh, at all or uh, shall I put one after the other? Shall I, shall I answer each one? and? sort of keep it relevant to the yeah, question. Just, just two, two or three of it. Uh, okay. This is the first one. The second one is in uh, classification of conditions requiring pediatric palliative care, that whole slide, uh, it would be uh, appreciated if you could explain it once more. And the third point is that miracle of hope. Uh, I found it, found it very interesting. So if we can elaborate the miracle of hope. These are yes. the three, three things. Yes, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm delighted. Thank you for asking those questions. I think that it's, it's really great to have those questions. Can I talk about wonder? Because first of all, children can surprise you. That, that little one who just turned three, he was dying and he knew he was dying. And he had very few words. He had, he, he, his background had been such that he hadn't had much developmental stimulation. And he, um, he came from a very poor family. His parents had died. And despite the fact that he was so young, when he was dying, he showed me that he wanted me to pick him up, take him outside, point to my car. And then with a the few words that he had, he told me where he wanted to go and the people that he wanted to see. 
And in between, I'd have to take him back to the hospice to get a bit of oxygen and then take him off again. And he had me running around all day. And then in the evening, some of my colleagues and volunteers went to see him. And they said, they could see that he was seeing some and trying, reaching out. He was seeing something. And the next day he died. And it was his way of saying to us, I want to go. I want to see my favorite people. I want to see my favorite places, including the ducks. Um, and he completed his tasks. And to me, that was wonderful. And I've had so many children who have shown me that they, they know they're dying. You know, the parents say, no, he doesn't know he's so sick. And of course he does. And so to have that sense of wonder, but also when you're with the children, especially out in nature, nature isn't the most wonderfully therapeutic place to be. And when you're out in nature, to watch that child as they're looking at the light in the trees, when they're listening to the birds, when they're picking a flower, when they're looking upside down at a tortoise and wondering when they see the shell where that little head is and the legs have gone to in the shell. And not to think, oh, you know, this is a child, but to actually share with them that sense of wonder because then they're gonna communicate with you so much better. Um, and then also it, goes, it takes us back. I said to you, the oldest part of each one of us is our, uh, the inner child, is to take us back to that inner child as well so that we can connect better to these children. And then the classification. That is something that we, we like to use because if we can classify the child into a certain category, then it gives us an idea of what the pro prognosis is, how this disease is going to progress, and it helps for us to explain to the family, explain to the child if they're old enough, and to decide on what sort of treatment and what sort of intensity of treatment that we will use. So if that child is born, with a congenital or genetic condition, which we know has absolutely no hope of cure. There's no medication or treatment that can that can cure this child. And we know that we're just going to give, we're going to give comfort care, we're going to keep that child pain free, we're going to keep them loved and warm and fed. Um, and we're going to, it helps us when we decide what to tell the parents and how to support that the parents along that whole trajectory. And remembering that sometimes these conditions are diagnosed in uterus. So when that child is still not born, that parents know that a child would say an um, encephaly, that there are one or two of children who have lived for a year, even two, but nearly all of those children either die in utero before birth or, or shortly after birth. So we can start preparing and supporting the families as well. And then with a child like with cerebral palsy, where they're going to need a level of palliative supervision for the family as well um, throughout their lives to prevent them getting bed sores and worse contractures and malnutrition. Um, so it, it helps us in deciding what the treatment and the care is going to be for this child and that family. And that's why the classification is very helpful. Um, I know not everybody uses it now, we all used it a lot, but I think it's because they've forgotten how helpful the classification is. And then with spirituality, I spoke about that, the miracle of hope. And it's wonderful to see that even when the parents intellectually, know, they know that this child's condition is going to deteriorate and at some stage they're going to be looking at the death of the child, at the back of their mind, there's often that miracle of hoping at first for a cure. Of course, that's what parents hope for. They try to raise money to take the child to Mexico or to America or somewhere where there's a new research and a new form of treatment. But as that child's disease progresses, that hope always stays there. And so the hope is, I hope my child lives just that bit longer. The child is hoping, I hope I can do some things that my friends are doing. And so when we've got teenagers, we always talk to their friends and say, look, involve them as much as you can, because 
your friend wants to be like you. He wants to be a normal teenager. Lovely uh, 16 year old we had who had a brain tumor, a diagnosed at 10 years of age. And, and so it went from being a 10 year old a child to being a teenager with all the desires and hopes of teenagers. And her friends were totally amazing. Where there was a party, Susan had to go, whether it was for half an hour. And her friends would come to the house and they'd put on a pretty wig and they made sure she wore nice clothes because she went blind from her tumor. And they told all the young men at the party that they had to pay attention to Susan. So they'd hoped that Susan had it being a normal teenager. We couldn't give her normal, we couldn't give her the life of her friends, but she could have that hope of being at a party, having a young man speak to her, having a young man ask her to dance, even in a wheelchair. And that miracle of hope just kept her alive and alight when she was dying. But then the miracle of hope is the hope for relief of symptoms. Parents don't want to see their child suffer. They want to know that if their child has pain, that pain will be treated. But if they have other symptoms, we will treat those symptoms. But we won't leave them alone and the child alone to cope with what is such a difficult thing for families to go through. And for that child to know that they can continue to hope that they will be cared for until the end. And then, depending on the cultural and belief system, the hope for what happens after death as well. So if we have a child who's, um, I'm a Christian, and where I live, most children belong to some form of the Christian faith. Um, and so our belief is in life after death. And if there are transitional rituals that have to take place, so if a child is a Catholic or like myself, an Anglican, we will ask for the anointing. We will ask for um, communion if that child is, can take communion and for the family. But it's really to help them with that hope as the hope continues to change. And if parents says it's hopeless, then we always say to them, no, the hope is always there and the hope will remain. But let's see what kind of hope that we can discuss and share with you. So that miracle of hope we never take away because how do you get up in the morning for those parents without having some Thing to hold on to and if we take the hope away then that can mean that they just feel totally what's the point um, so we never ever take hope away we just help them to see hope in a different light with their child would you like any more Jayanta any more uh, yeah thank you ma'am it uh, uh, makes the points uh, more elaborate, but at the same time, I feel very overwhelmed that it might be very tough to work as a pediatric palliative care giver. Uh, it requires a lot of courage and inner strength to be in this work in this field. And also, really, it, sorry, sorry, Jayanta, please continue. No, there is nothing to continue, ma'am, please. And maybe to address that, because um, that's an important thing that you have said. And it's a question, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to work internationally um, in every region of the world. And the question I always get asked is, how do you do this work? How do you work with children who die? And the first thing we say is you've got to work on yourself. What is your feeling about death and dying? How accepting are you? What is your belief system? Because unless you work on yourself and your inner spirituality, and here I'm, you know, religion comes into it, but it's that inner spirituality, that sense of something greater than you are, that sense of connectedness. Um, so you work on yourself. The second thing is if you're working in the field, you have to be part of a team because working in a team gives you strength. You know, the day you feel, oh, I can't, because you get, you just love these children. You really do. You can't help it. It's just something that, that you, they creep into your heart. They don't even creep. They just climb in boots and all. Um, 
but you need to work as part of a team and you need to recognize your own limitations. So I might be counseling a teenager and then think he needs more, he needs more, and then refer him to the psychologist, refer him to the social worker. And sometimes they're quite happy just talking to, to myself as the counselor, that little child who, you know, like the children who came and said, what does it mean to be dead? All they wanted from me was a simple answer. Once they told me what they thought and I spoke to them, then they were quite happy. They, they didn't need any further counseling or anything like that. So again, it's, we learn by experience. The child is the teacher and we need to work on ourselves and as part of a team. Always say, if I get to a stage I can't handle it, then I need to stand back and I need to say somebody who is actually more capable of dealing with this child needs to take over. So it's, it's inner awareness and being part of a team. And it's actually a wonderful field to work in because children are just so wonderful. And um, they, you know, you can have so much fun and joy with them. People think it's, we have our, our children's hospice here in Bloemfontein that I started in, uh, 25 years ago this year. And we have the house where we have children who can't be cared for at home for many different reasons. And we have a big community program as well. And if I wanted to grant a balance between tears and, and joy, I would say joy outweighs the tears a hundredfold. And the sense of, you know, if, if you are comfortable with death, then you're going to take that over to the children and at a level you're going to be accept their dying and then continue to support the family as you can because the death of a child is, is the worst thing that can happen to a family. Thank you, ma'am. Is there any doubts? Any more questions? And as I say, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful field to work in. And I promise you, if you, if you, if you go in um, and start working with these kids, they are such wise old souls and they teach you so much. You know, you, you might tell them something and they don't understand it. You know, an adult might pretend that they understood. But a child would look at you and say, that doesn't make sense. Can't be like that. Um, it teaches you actually to, to reflect on your own abilities with communication. And children die. You know, much as we would like every single child to live, to become an adult, the reality is that children die. And we can either stand back and say, they die, but I can't deal with it. Or we can say, well, what do we do about it to make the world a better place for these children? And for their families. And you're very welcome to contact me by email or WhatsApp or whatever, if, if you have any questions. Um, in, and, and those resources that you'll find at the end of my presentation is, um, as I say, they're available on the International Children's Palliative Care Network website, free download. And the, um, the courses that you can do, they're all free. And they are approved by the University of South Wales. Um, and you can do those courses. And there are a couple of the courses that are in Hindi. Um, but, but as I said, they're free. You do them in your own time. And you do get a certificate approved by the University of South Wales at the end of every course. So if you want to know more, I really would recommend doing the ICPCN online courses. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the value of the session.
it's a great pleasure. It's been really lovely to be with everyone. And it's always lovely to be with Pali in India. And I'm going to be there in December. I'm coming to Pallium India in December. We're running a workshop. We are waiting for you, ma'am. Yeah. Meet some of you. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you, ma'am. That was a wonderful session. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Have a nice day. Let's meet you in the next session. Bye. Thank you so much.